My name is David Green. I'm a consultant anaesthetist at King's College Hospital in London. Following the discovery of insulin by Banting and Best, King's has actually specialised in diabetic patients and was the first hospital in England to have a consultant diabetic physician. As a result, we still get a very large number of diabetic patients for major revascularization procedures, and this presents us with many challenges, both surgical and anaesthetic. How much interest is there in the use of advanced protocols to guide perioperative fluid optimization? British guidelines on intravenous fluid therapy in adult surgical patients now recommends flow monitoring, although accepting that this is logistically difficult. I have been using uh, esophageal Doppler, Doppler technology since about 1984, and most recently have switched to the Lidco technology. This, of course, requires the placement of a radial arterial line, which I now do routinely in my vascular patients. As a result, I no longer adhere to uh, rigid protocols, such as giving certain amounts of Hartmann's uh, fluids on an hourly basis. What has changed to make technology more applicable to high-risk surgical patients? The pulmonary artery catheter is much too invasive for the majority of high-risk surgical patients, certainly in my practice. Much less invasive technology is now available, such as Doppler, or using radial artery pressure monitoring and converting that pressure waveform into flow, and thus it is much more applicable to a, a much greater variety and a higher percentage of high-risk surgical patients. What do you mean by high-risk vascular surgery patient? Yes, these patients are by anybody's standards high-risk ASA 3 or 4 patients. They've got other comorbidities apart from being elderly. They have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease very often. They have renal failure or renal impairment. They've had previous myocardial infarctions. They then undergo procedures often lasting five or six hours. Traditionally, they would be monitored perhaps with the central venous pressure monitoring and then would have been transferred almost certainly to a high dependency environment or even an intensive care unit. Do you think there is a need for convergence of monitoring technologies in the perioperative care of high-risk patients? Yes, I do. Um, for example, not only do we need to advance our monitoring to measure oxygen delivery in the patients, and this of course is not done routinely, but what we also need to do is to make sure that oxygen delivery is satisfactory for that patient. In other words, we do need to close the loop. One of the ways we've been doing this recently is with the Invos cerebral oximeter, which not only acts as a monitor of adequacy of cerebral oxygenation, but there's a lot of evidence accumulating that it's a good monitor of overall oxygen delivery supply, supply demand requirements. Can you tell us about your experience of using the Lidco Rapid Hemodynamic Monitor in combination with the BIS Depth of Anesthesia Monitor? Yes, I've been using the BIS monitor to measure depth of anaesthesia or cortical suppression since 2004 in all my general anaesthetic patients. I now use total intravenous anaesthesia exclusively using propofol and remifentanil and I believe it to be mandatory. Now since 2006 I've been using the LIDCO uh, cardiac output monitoring and flow monitoring device and we found very interesting relationships between depth of anaesthesia and its effect on cardiac output. Now that you've adopted the Lidco Rapid, have you changed the way you use central venous catheters? Yes, well I did use central venous pressure monitoring routinely in these patients and I did monitor CVP and I did look at the levels of central venous pressure to see whether I was maintaining at a particular level. Increasing evidence has now accumulated that central venous pressure gives you no idea of the patient's responsiveness to fluids. So I no, no longer believe it's, it's reasonable or rational to maintain CVP at a predefined level. As a result of that, I only put in a central line when I need IV access, when I can't get a good peripheral line elsewhere. I no longer use or measure central venous pressure to assess fluid requirements. Can you describe the interactions between depth of anaesthesia, hydration levels and falling blood pressure? As all anaesthetists know, blood pressure falls at induction. 
Normally, this is only measured at maybe up to five-minute intervals by non-invasive means, and then the arterial line is put in post-induction. But if you measure it from the time of induction, you see that this fall in blood pressure is driven mainly by a change in stroke volume rather than is traditionally assumed a change in systemic vascular resistance. If you look at that stroke volume change and equate it with induction of anaesthesia and the BIS level, in other words, cortical suppression, there is a fairly close relationship between stroke volume fall and cortical suppression, which isn't really surprising, I suppose. The other interesting thing is, post-induction, when the patient is intubated and ventilated, we can look at the stroke volume variation to say now, is this patient fluid depleted or not? And we found the patients who are fluid depleted, as evidenced by high stroke volume variation, have the greatest fall in stroke volume at induction.